Good evening and thank you for joining me on The Griot. I am your host, Mark Lamont Hill. Tonight we will be spending an entire hour talking to Detroit's former mayor, Kwame Kilpatrick. From the state house to the big house, Kwame Kilpatrick has been through his share of triumphs and trials. And in 2001, we got to know him when he became Detroit's youngest mayor when he was elected at the age of 31. His first term, while celebrated, was also riddled with criticism, including accusations of misuse of city funds and a city-issued credit card. But despite that, he was successful in his run for a second term. In September 2008, however, he was forced to resign because of numerous scandals. And in 2013, Kilpatrick was sentenced to 28 years in prison after being convicted on 24 counts, including uh, bribery, conspiracy, extortion, and fraud. And his sentence was commuted to the shock of many in 2021 by former President Donald J. Trump. Later that year, he launched Movemental Ministries. He wrote a book called Off the Grid, A Journey Back to Destiny. And now he spends his life with his new family, his mission, and his ministry. And he joins us right now. Kwame Kilpatrick, my brother, welcome to the Grio. Man, that's a whole life in a quick synopsis, brother. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I did my best, man. I, a little, little something, little something. T tell me, though, the stuff that we don't know. You know, a lot of times people think your life began in 2002 when you became the mayor. How'd you get there? What, what drove you to that space where you wanted to be a politician? Well, I grew up in the city of Detroit where our mayor my entire life growing up there was Coleman Alexander Young. And I, I just, hmm. he was my hero. I wanted to be just like him in terms of politics. But then my mother and father were also elected officials. My mother was elected to the state house when I was eight years old. My father was elected to the Wayne County Commission when I was uh, about 10 or 11 years old. And so I grew up campaigning. I knew how to run a campaign by the time I was 14 years old. Went to Cass Technical High School, got a football scholarship to Florida A&M University. But back when I was in grade school in Detroit, I won a contest, a black studies contest, where the winner got to meet the mayor of the city. And I went to the mayor's mansion. It was about a 30-second meeting with Coleman Young. He shook my hand. He said, hey, big fella, you know, one day you could be mayor. And what I heard is one day you're going to be mayor. And so from that time forward, I was telling everybody, I'm going to be mayor of the city and be mayor of the city. And when I came back home, I taught school in the Detroit public school system for three and a half years. And then I ran for office at 25 years old. I ran for the state house, my mother's former seat. She went on to Congress and I ran for her former seat and won. And that started my career. I was the first African-American and the youngest person in the history of Michigan to be leader of the state house. And then I launched um, into the mayor's office where I won my campaign and then won re-election. I talked to a lot of politicians from state houses all the way up to presidents. And there's two kinds of people I meet in all those positions, people who want to change the world and people who want to run the world. When you decided you want to run for office, what was your vision? Did, what, what was your motivation for wanting to be the first mayor of Detroit? I most definitely wanted to change the world. I grew up in a city that was uh, the butt of all jokes uh, for throughout the 1970s and 80s. Um, they were saying things like the last person out of Detroit turned the lights out. Um, everything I ever saw on television was inferior uh, about Detroit. It was, it was portraying us, even within the region, as you know, back then and even as late as the 2010 census, Detroit was the most racially segregated region in the country. 84% black city surrounded by 84% whites and so white suburbs. And so it was this constant race friction. And so I grew up being able to talk to anybody. I was leader of the state house. It wasn't but 18 black folks and they, they elected me leader out of 110 people. And so I was able to talk to people, uh, build with people and I wanted to change uh, the world. I didn't definitely didn't want to run it. I had no visions of grandeur of being president or anything like that. I, I just wanted to change how Detroit was introducing itself to the world. And I think we did that in my term. And also at the end, I was the reason why we got the bad name again. Well, talk to me about that part, because somewhere between that wide eyed young man in the state house and that young mayor, people call him the hip hop mayor, all that stuff is happening. But then 
People talking about you driving, or your wife at the time driving Lincoln Navigators. People are talking about spending too much money. People talking about parties. How did you go from the person that wanted to change the world to the person that was engaged in this stuff that would give a, a, a bad mark to the city? You know, I think it was part of uh, youthful exuberance and uh, stupidity, um, some pride and arrogance uh, mixed with the, the niggerization process. And I'm going to say it just like that. If we don't agree, oh, let's talk about it. Um, mm. We, uh, you know, we leased the car for $20,000 for two years, and it became, oh, he got this fancy car with rims on it. No rims on it, nothing. But it was portrayed in the paper. They had me with gold chains on and, and gold teeth in my mouth. And it, it, was, it was this constant barrage. Six weeks into the office, um, it was bad articles, just an overwhelming plethora of horrible articles. But at the same time, we was closing casino deals, building more housing than ever, fixing more roads than ever. The blueprint that Detroit is doing a miraculous job of building on now, the riverfront, the casino, seven or eight new hotels. You know, Mark, I, there hadn't been a new hotel in the city of Detroit since 1989 when I got there in 2001. We built seven hotels in five years. So you weren't hearing about the, uh, my work. You were always hearing about me. And I think that was the issue. And I, I, I believe real Detroiters, those people who have been there throughout the entire period, they understand the difference. But they also saw a proud and arrogant man. You know, you get to the point. I used to watch Coleman Young cuss people out on TV. And I would wonder, why is he doing that, even though I liked it? Why is he doing it? <laughs> um, but after a while, you understand the frustration of being able to lift the city out of debt at that time, to be able to move the city for it, to host Super Bowls and Major League All-Star Games, to put Detroit in a new place, but then they want to talk to you about uh, where you out at a party last night. And that thing well, was Let me ask you so a question about that, though. Do you, think, do, do you think that the people who were obsessed with you as a personality, do you think they were focusing on you to hide your successes and your victories? Or do you think that they couldn't see your successes and victories because of how you were operating? It, you, 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 if you couldn't see what Detroit was doing in 2001 versus how it looked in 2005 or six, you just couldn't mm. see. It was a totally and completely different city. Uh, the downtown development, the total new uh, renovation and, and re redevelopment of campus marshes by coordinating nine different departments, changing the underground ut utilities, the lightings, how the streets even go downtown, the new casinos, the new hotels, the new storefronts that they're all building on right now. If you didn't see the development in Midtown and Wayne State, you couldn't see. It was only to hide that. And you know, Mark, um, they started early talking about the fact that Detroit, is it time? It was articles in the paper during my second term of it's time for white mayor. And, and I just thought that was amazing to put in the paper. I don't believe that's something that could be a headline today after everything that's been going on. But back then, that was passe. That was just politically acceptable in the city of Detroit. Uh, and they got what they wanted. Mm. When you think about the f moment where you had to resign, uh, the first yes. uh, scandal, the first prison sentence, uh, relatively short. Yeah. Uh, at that yes. moment, did you think, all right, I've learned my lesson, I'm going to come back again? I know you promised you'd be back. Did you, did you think that this was all going to go away and you'd be able to kind of revive your political career? What was your mindset like at that moment? Um, I was not talking about politics at that time. Um, mm. I was not interested in being elected even then. Um, in 2008, my mindset was that I've been stepped on and squashed. A lot of it I brought on my own self, a lot of stupid decisions, a lot of um, pride and arrogance. Um, I was really thinking about coming back from that and being the man who God had called me to be originally. And, it, you know, it wasn't re resurrecting my political career as much as it was resurrecting my name. And so I thought at that time I'd be left alone. I can go off and, and, and relocate. We moved to Dallas, Texas. Uh, my sons graduated from Dallas schools, um, and I thought we could live our lives. And little did I know that the feds have been investigating me since February 4th of 2002. Exactly one month after I took office, they opened up a, an investigation on me. One month after you I took office. You didn't even have time to break the law yet. Look, 
I think you did some stuff wrong. We're going to talk about that after the break. But the idea that the investigation started basically as soon as you, uh, you know, got, got, got the, the, the drapes up in the office is something that's stunning to me and something that I, I only see happening to us. And by us, I mean black folk. Kwame, hang right there. We're going to come back. Everybody on the grill, we're here with Kwame Kilpatrick all night. Uh, we dive into life behind bars. We talk about his political future. We talk about his ministry, his family, and so much more. Stay with us. We'll be right back. New on the Grio, Masters of the Game. You know, I was my biggest uh, obstacle because I really believe what people told me. Being told, I sound ignorant. I'm country. You need to cover that accent. It's not professional. I created this person that I thought would win. She was uh, trying to fit in. If you try to fit in, honey, you can't stand out. Sit down one-on-one -on -one with black people who dominate the game. I think we are at a time in the world where people are so quick to judge. I'm going to be a source of joy and life and happiness and laughter. And I think that's what draws people. I don't care who you are, where you're from, what color you are, what your belief is. None of that matters. It's matters of the heart and mouth. You know, and sometimes I show up and I might be your friend, I might be your sister, your mama, your auntie, whatever it is you need in that moment. I'm all right with it all. Because I feel like that's part of my purpose. Go is to feed the soul. And that's that's what I did. Every Friday at 8 p.m., right here on The Grio. Check your local listings.